Hey, good evening, church family. We're excited to welcome you back to church this evening. Join me in singing, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Let's sing it again. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. All right, Jesus, what a mighty name. Jesus, what a mighty name. Every knee will bow to you, and every tongue proclaim that he's Jesus. What a mighty name, forever you shall reign. The name above all names, Jesus, what a mighty name. Jesus, what a mighty name. Every knee will bow to you and every tongue proclaim that he's Jesus. What a mighty name, forever you shall reign the name above all names, Jesus, what a mighty name. All right, we know this song, He is Exalted. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted forever, exalted, and I will praise His name. the Lord, and forever his truth shall reign, heaven and earth, oh rejoice in his holy name, he is exalted, the king is exalted on high, one more time, he is exalted, the king is exalted on high, I will praise him. He is exalted forever, exalted, and I will praise his name. And he is the Lord, and forever his truth shall reign, heaven and earth. Oh, rejoice in his holy name. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. Great singing. Here we go, Pastor Bobby. Well, good evening, church family. Good to be in the house of God again together. Uh, and what I wanted to do tonight, I want to give you a couple of announcements just by way of reminder. That way you can make sure that you are aware of what is going on here at the church. Um, all church family camp is not happening, but junior camp and senior camp are. Uh, so you can sign up at the info desk, or you can also email any one of us as staff members. We will get your name on the list there, and we'll have some further information. Things are a little fluid, but uh, we'll do our best to communicate with you that way. Just as a reminder, Wednesday night services are live stream only right now. Uh, we are having in-person services at 830 
a.m., 10 a.m., and 6 p.m. on Sundays, and that will continue. And if anything changes, uh, we will let you know and make you aware of that. And what I wanted to do tonight before we pray and continue singing is uh, read a portion of Scripture. Uh, it's important to keep the Word of God central in what we do, and sometimes it's just good to, to meditate and read through a portion. So I'm going to read Philippians chapter number 1. Now, there's 30 verses, but I think it will be helpful and beneficial to us. Paul is writing, he says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always, in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it, until the day of Jesus Christ, even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. But I would, ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing competent by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ of envy, even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached? And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Uh, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake having the same conflict which ye saw in me and now here to be in you. Church, let's pray. God, I want to come before you tonight, Lord, in the spirit of the Apostle Paul and pray that our church would be one where we are striving together for the faith of the gospel, that we would be unified around the message of Jesus and the work that you want to do in our lives and in our community. God, as Paul prayed for the church at Philippi in verses 9 through 11, Lord, I pray that our church would have love that abounds more and more, that we would approve things that are excellent, that we would uh, make right judgments. God, I pray that Scripture would be the basis of everything we do. Lord, I'm so encouraged by the work that you are doing here and the thought of what you will do in the future. God, I pray that you'd be with our service tonight as we sing and as we hear your word. Lord, may it make a difference in our life. I pray that you be with Brother David as he preaches. Give him just the clarity to deliver the message that you have for us. Lord, that we would be receptive, um, that we would leave here different because we have heard from you. God, we love you. In your name, amen. Church, we're going to continue singing. Uh, Jeremiah is going to come now.
Wonderful. We've been singing about Jesus' name and lifting up his name. He's exalted. Jesus, what a mighty name. And all of that should just cause us to stir up into this one phrase and just to proclaim, my Jesus, I love thee. So sing that song with me right now. My Jesus, I love thee. I know. singing. Here you go, Pastor David. Thank you, Jeremiah. Wonderful job. It's my favorite hymn. My Jesus, I love thee. It's good to be here to this evening. Welcome you in. Glad that uh, you could join us there on uh, live stream and I'm just thankful for the opportunity tonight to be able to share God's word and speak into your hearts um, through the word of God this evening. And I'm just so thankful for our church and uh, their perseverance through the last few months and um, their encouragement. And it's been a wonderful thing to see uh, us rally together and to, um, to work together for the cause of Christ, even though uh, things have been quite different. And uh, we weren't expecting this. We came back here in uh, March, uh, March the 9th, and it, um, we were really excited to be here with our church family and and be a part of uh, the services and things. And it, it wasn't until just a couple of weeks ago that we were actually able to see everybody and be part of services. And so it's been quite different, quite, quite strange, and not what we were thinking. But I'm just so thankful that we could be back here and to, um, and to um, get some um, rest here for the last few months. Um, um, my family and I, we're planning on going back or going to the East Coast um, in August. And so... Uh, this coming uh, next month in July, we're going to be uh, traveling around to some churches here in the Northwest, and so we ask you to pray, pray for us as we do that. I'm so thankful that we could be here for the last few months and help in, in whatever ways we could help, and uh, it's just been a blessing for us, and, and just pray for us when, as we uh, get ready to uh, start um, these next few months of reporting to different churches and stuff. So I'm also thankful that uh, Jeremiah and Amanda are here and uh, are getting used to things here, and I'm excited for them, and I hope the church will get behind them and encourage them. And, and it was good to see Jeremiah up here, his first time uh, leading, and uh, he did a great job. And uh, so make sure that you encourage them and get behind them. And I'm excited that the Lord's called someone else to uh, reach uh, to reach uh, the Chinese people. They're still the largest people group in the world, and they need Christ desperately. And so 
Uh, we'll be praying for them as they um, are looking toward, uh, forward to that goal. So I invite you tonight to turn to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, and um, we're going to, I'm going to read down into verse, um, verse 16 this evening. We're not going to focus on all those verses. We're going to focus in on the, on the first uh, six verses tonight, uh, but we will um, kind of mention through some of the other verses as well. But here in Ephesians chapter 4, if you have your Bible, please turn there. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through uh, 16. I'll read it out loud here. It says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. And Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, and led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, but, or excuse me, what what is it, but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Lord, I ask that you bless your word, and I pray that you'd help us as we learn from it tonight, that you would speak through it. May your spirit be with us and give us power and wisdom. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the writings of, of Ephesians are wonderful, wonderful writings, full of ecclesiastic, ecclesiastical doctrines, and it, it, it beautifully summarizes the gospel story and how it, should, how it should reshape every part of our life story. It speaks of our position, that we are in Christ. It speaks of who we are in Christ, that we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. It speaks here in Ephesians of God's purpose for us and God's plan. It speaks of God's grace upon us. And that is just in the first three chapters. It is packed full of good doctrine for us. Then, here in chapter 4, Paul switches gears and applies these principles to our living. How these principles are to be lived out. And so he starts here in chapter 4 with what? The life of the church, the church body and how we are to function together. The spiritual family. We are a spiritual family here in our church, and this family has many different uh, different kinds of people from many different walks of life, and many differing ideas, and and opinions, and preferences, and cultures, and even microcultures. But here it is emphasized that these people and we, as a church, are to become one. And the word one here is the key word in this chapter. You look down as he, is, he, he implores them to, 
to uh, work together in unity. He, he mentions some things. There's the one body and one spirit and one hope and, and uh, one Lord and one faith, one baptism, one God. All of these ideas bringing us back to the idea of unity and being one. That these people and we as a people have many different talents and different abilities, different gifts, God-given gifts by the grace of God, etc. And they, and they are to use, and we are to use our differences as a way to serve God and to serve each other and to accomplish God's redeeming work here on earth. And so tonight, I want to speak to this. The, the title of this message is The Hard Work of Unity. The Hard Work of Unity. So Paul brings, brings us into this chapter and challenges us to live out the doctrines in, verses, or in chapters 1 through 3 and what those things should look like. And so as we begin, I want you to understand, number one, that unity is not uniformity. Unity is not uniformity. Churches since the very beginning have struggled with this. They've struggled with this. The Corinthian church struggled with this. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul writes to them that we are one body with many members and we all have different functions and we have all have uniqueness about us, but that we are to come together as one body to work and serve the Lord. The Roman church struggled with this and they fought one another uh, about their different preferences and, 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 and what they should eat and what they should celebrate and all of these different things. And Paul is telling them to, to look past those things for the work of the Lord. I, I find it interesting over in John chapter 9 uh, that uh, this uniformity is something that we all struggle with. Uniformity, and, and we have this kind of feeling that we all uh, that that if, if that we if I like the color blue, then you all have to also like the color blue. And if you don't like the color blue, then then we can't be friends, and we can't work together. Okay, and so uh, we have this fear of not not fitting in with with the group, not fitting in with other people. And God wants us to celebrate some of those differences and some of those uniquenesses and some of those things about us, not fight over these things. I look at at the fear in John chapter 9 where we see the blind man that Jesus sees and he and he talks and, 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 and interacts with this blind man and he goes over to this pool of Siloam and he, he, he washes there. And of course, we know this story is very interesting because Jesus spits in the dirt and he takes the dirt and he wipes it on the eyes of this blind man. And, and immediately the blind man receives his sight. As we uh, look down through this story, this narrative, we understand that um, it, was, it was found out that uh, it was, this was... Um, um, during the Sabbath day that Jesus had healed, healed this man. And so the Pharisees were up in arms and, and uh, um, they, they were talking to this man and trying to figure out what was going on. And of course they realized it was Jesus. And they said, well, this is not true. This could not have happened. He did not work a miracle. And so they went to find the parents. They asked his parents uh, what they knew. And they were so scared to give, him, to give them the right answer because they wanted to fit in. Okay? And you look here in verse 20, it says, And his parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind, but by what means he now seeth, we know not. And who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age. Ask him. He shall speak for himself. They were so scared of the Pharisees that they didn't want to admit that they actually knew that it was Jesus. You see there in verse 22 it says, These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogues. Therefore said his parents, 
he is of age, ask him. And so we all struggle with this idea of fitting in. We want to fit in. We want to be part of a group that's built into us as a people. We want to be part of groups. And so we have this feeling, and we have this feeling that if we need to agree with everything, with everything. And so we see that this blind man's parents were much like that. We want to fit in. So we think the only way that will happen is if we, we do everything the same way. We have to be in agreement with what, what fashion is appropriate. We have to be in agreement with what song styles we enjoy singing. If not, then, 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 then and I don't want to have anything to do with you. You're not my friend. And, and I don't want to talk to you. And I don't want to be a part of you. And, and I don't want to be a part of, this, of your family. I, I can't be your, your brother or sister. I can't relate with you. And that's wrong. That is wrong. It's not about uniformity. It's differences aren't the problem. It's how we handle the differences. Martin Lloyd Jones says, "Not to be in fellowship with those who are born again is to be guilty of schism, which is sinful." And I agree. Howard Hendricks says, "Many of us in the church are like porcupines trying to huddle together on a bitter cold night to keep each other warm, but we continually poke and hurt each other the closer we get. Unity does not mean that everybody is the same or has the same opinions about preferences and things like that, but we honor these things and we work together despite those differences. Our church... We have um, the, these 20 fundamentals that we believe in. We have a small book that has them all in there. And we as a church need to agree on those things. Those are foundational truths from the Word of God. And we won't waver on those things. We won't waver on that God is, is a trinity. We won't wa- a waver that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that He came and was a man and He 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 bore no or He knew no sin and He died on the cross to save us from our sins. We won't uh, we won't waver on those things. We won't move on those things. We as a church are in agreement with that. We all know that, and so we come together in the unity of those foundations. But other things that. You like and that I may not like doesn't really matter. It shouldn't matter. Unity is not uniformity. That's why Paul here in Ephesians chapter 4 and down in verse 11, he, he, he celebrates that. He says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And so there is a, an eclectic group here to help the church And they all have different abilities and different backgrounds and different points of view and ways of thinking about things. I enjoy that. I enjoy being being able to understand someone else's point of view and I value that. Sometimes I'm a little bit too, uh, uh, too focused on one thing and it's good to have somebody else's point of view to understand things a little bit better. Unity is not uniformity. Secondly, unity is not just in action, but it starts as an attitude. We think that, and like I said, we think unity, we, we have to agree. Uh, we have this kind of weird mindset that we have to agree on every little thing. And that's not true. It's not true. We, be, but despite those, those things that we don't uh, see eye to eye on and we don't I have a preference this way you have a preference that way we still strive to work together that's unity that's where unity is tested true unity is tested and so this kind of unity isn't an action per se but it starts as an attitude a heart attitude and so that's what Paul says he says that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. So he's telling them, act like Christ. Walk worthy of the vocation. We have the same goal. Working together on the same team. We're not enemies. Our enemy, he goes on to say in chapter 6, is not uh, flesh and blood, right? But is uh, of these of the darkness, rulers of the darkness of this world. Our enemy, our true enemy is Satan. 
It's not, it's not your fellow man. Sometimes we're too focused on the wrong place there. But we as Christians and we as a church family are on the same team working toward the same goal. And so Paul says, walk worthy of this vocation with we, which you're called. And so you're thinking maybe in your mind, okay, walk worthy of the vocation. So, so I need to do these certain things. I need to do some certain things in order to be considered walking worthy of the calling that God has given to us to redeem the time and to, uh, and to spread the gospel around the world. But that's not what Paul says. Paul then tells us what it means to walk worthy of this vocation. What does he say? With all, first of all, lowliness. All lowliness. The word lowliness here means to be humble, to have humbleness about you, to, to, to humble yourself, to not think that your opinion is, is, is uh, uh, so important, uh, and to value yourself uh, uh, less than others. It says here in, a, in Philippians chapter 2, or excuse me, uh, yeah, Philippians chapter 2. It says here, if there be uh, therefore any consolation in Christ, any, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any vows of mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. So he's talking here again about unity, Paul is. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But in, here he goes, lowliness of mind. Humble yourself, he says. Let each esteem other better than themselves. So my opinion isn't as important as what I think it is. My preference shouldn't, shouldn't be the thing that drives me. Look not, upon, not every man upon his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And then he says, let this mind be in you. This is the mind of Jesus Christ. He was humble and lowly. Who being the form of a, uh, in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as man, it says here, he humbled himself. So Paul says for us to show unity with one another, that we are going to need to show humbleness, that we, were go- we need to be lowly in mind, unselfish sacrifice for others, a willingness to think of your own opinions and feelings le- as less important. Wow. That really fights against our human nature, doesn't it? We want to be heard. We want our voice to be heard. We want our opinions to matter. That's not what Paul says here. That's not what the Word of God says. It says also not only lowliness, but meekness. This idea of meekness, of not being harsh, not being rough, right? And not being in your face and not being um, so curt with people and not uh, just spilling your opinion on them and not not thinking about their feelings about it having this mildness and meekness the word this word idea of meekness is it actually means strength under control the quality of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self importance psalm 37:11 says but the meek shall inherit the earth. Does that sound familiar to you? I think Jesus quoted that in the Beatitudes, didn't he? Right? The meek shall inherit the earth. In Psalm 37, 11, it says, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Right? Meekness will get you a long way in life. A long way. Meekness. So in order for us to walk worthy of our calling, we need to be humble. We need to be meek. These are things that will bring about unity within a church body. He also says here, with long-suffering, long-suffering, this idea of patience and not easily angered, not not, not having a knee-jerk reaction to what somebody says to you. It stands against hostility and holding a grudge. Ooh, man, we're, we're all guilty of that. Holding a grudge. And impatience. You know, 
as humans, we tend to be very resistant to change. And change is sometimes, change is hard and it takes time to get used to. And so it's for some, they want change quickly. And they want people to just kind of come along and do as, as what their idea and what they want to do. And we're in a hurry for others to adopt our point of view or uh, 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 get their act together. But when it comes to our own lives, well, we realize that it takes time and we must extend to others the same kind of patience that we, wished, uh, that we wish for them to extend to us. Patience is one of the core Christian virtues. It, it, it's vital to Christian unity. It's absolutely vital to Christian unity that we show patience to one another. It also says here, walking worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called that we are to forbear, forbearing one another in love. Tolerance. Looking past people's, I don't know, things that might bother you about them, right? Because of love. Love drives you. If you really have the love of God within you, then that love will drive you to look past those things and be tolerant. I'm willing to look beyond our differences. I don't have to show I'm right and you're wrong. I don't have to. But many people are more concerned for what is best in their interest. And forbearing suggests that, that I will withhold what I really want to do or what I really want to say. I'll withhold that so that we can be unified. That's what love drives us to do. John MacArthur, he said, every problem that our church has ever faced can be tracked back to a lack of love. I agree. Another preacher put it like this. Behind most church fights and unresolved divisions is ugly human pride. And the worst kind of pride is religious pride. The pharisaical pride of self-righteousness and superiority. Someone who is forbearing another in love doesn't have to show their superiority. Doesn't have to show that they're right. It's not important to them. Proverbs 25, 15, it says, For long forbearing is a prince persuaded, and a soft tongue breaketh the bone. Colossians 3.13 says, Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. You don't have to win the argument. That's not the point. We do that in marriage a lot too. Husband thinks that he has to win the argument, or the wife thinks that she has to win the argument, and what? And they're going back and forth and back and forth, and you know they're not listening to one another. They're just thinking of what the next thing they want to say is, right? And why? Because they want to win the argument. They want to be right. That's pride. That's not forbearance. Marathon athlete Abel Mutai representing Kenya, was just a few meters from the finish line about uh, back in 2013, so about seven years ago. But he was confused with the signage at this particular track uh, that they were running, and so he stopped and, 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 and because he thought he had completed the race. And then right behind him was a Spanish athlete. His name was Ivan Fernandez. And he was right behind him. And he realized what was happening, that the Kenyan had just stopped because he thought he had finished the, ra he is, he had finished the race. And so he started shouting at the Kenyan to, 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 to go on and to keep going and to push forward and to, can you, to continue running. But Mutai, he, he didn't speak Spanish and, and didn't quite understand what was going on. And so you can watch the video. Uh, you could see the Spaniard pushing, literally pushing uh, Mutai forward. And pushed him to victory. Ivan could have won that race. He could have won it. But he allowed Mutai to win. 
And so afterwards, a journalist asked Yvonne, well, why did you do that? And Yvonne replied, my dream is that someday we can have a kind of community and family life. The journalist insisted, but why, why did you let the Kenyan win? Yvonne replied, I didn't let him win. He was going to win. The journalist insisted again, but you could have won. Ivan looked at him and replied, but what, what would be the merit of my victory? What would be the honor of that medal? What would, what would my mom think of that? Hmm. Are you most concerned with your opinion being right? Maybe like Yvonne, we, we should be more concerned about the unity of our family. Maybe like Yvonne, we should be asking ourselves, what, 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 would, what would be the merit of winning this argument? What would, be the, what would be the merit of me showing that I'm right to everybody else? What, what honor would I get from this? What honor would Christ get from this? And like Yvonne said, what would my mom think of that? What we should be saying, what, what would my father think of that? What is this going to accomplish if I, if I can get my way? If I can get my way, what will this accomplish? We are, frankly, we're, we're, we're intolerant of other p- viewpoints. Of differences. And, you know, over the years, God has led me to participate in churches of many widely differing viewpoints. As a missionary, you, 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 you go and you, don't know what, you never know what you're getting into uh, fr- from a Sunday morning to Sunday night. Never know what you're getting into. I mean, I've got some good stories. If you want to sit down with me and, and listen to some stories about churches and their different ways, I, I, I have a good time laughing about them because it's just so, they're so different. And so I celebrate those kinds of things. They all love the Lord. They all stand on the doctrines of God's word. Every one of them that that support us stand on the the fundam what we call the fundamentals of the faith. They're all in agreement. And they're all different. Every one of them are different. Every one of them. I have found uh, from from my from my time in different churches that what some people consider maybe very conservative churches, they say, well, they're very intolerant. And, and, and a lot of them are, I agree. But even churches that aren't, quote-unquote, conservative, which pride themselves on their tolerance, can't, they can be intolerant to those who disagree with them. It's on every side. It's in every person. The propensity to push away unity and not forbear in love. It's in us all. We are called as Christians here to be, to be tolerant to those who, who have different viewpoints and preferences. And we're called as Christians to endure, to bear with, and to put up with one another. And we, we, may, we may not be terribly comfortable with others sometimes. But our, our job description here, if we're going to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we're called, is to bear with one another to forbear. Look at Jesus. He put up with Peter's impetuousness. All right? James and John, they were they, James and John, they were so prideful. Thomas, what would we call him? Doubting Thomas, right? Wouldn't believe. Jesus had his eyes on what they would become, not their immaturities and blind sides. Forbearance and tolerance are necessary for the unity of the church walking worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called it's an attitude it starts as an attitude and eventually if you follow the lord and you obey his word here then it will come out as in your actions as unity the last thing i want you to understand here is that unity is not easily accomplished Verse 3 says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Unity is not easily accomplished. It says here, endeavoring to keep it. Endeavoring to keep it means it takes hard, hard work. It fights against everything our flesh is for. 
This unity does not spring out of your tolerance or intolerance. It, it says here that this unity is of the Spirit, right? It comes from the Spirit of God. And to sin against that unity, listen, to sin against that unity is to grieve the Holy Spirit that brings it. The Holy Spirit wants us to be unified. And so when you push that away for your, your, what you like and, what, and, what, and your ideas and how you think things should be, guess what? You are grieving the Spirit of God. The Spirit is the author of unity. And here we are commanded to maintain it by what? It says here by the bonds of peace that we're to tie, keep that tied together. Tied together with peace. Peace. You know, Jesus Christ, he knew that this was going to be a struggle. He knew that this was going to take work. I want you to see what he prayed before he went to the cross. You know it, most likely. In John chapter 17. John chapter 17, we see Jesus praying to the Father. And in verse 20, he says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So he's talking about the future church, isn't he? He's praying for the future church. He's praying for us, right? That they all may be what? One, it says. That they all may be one. What's he praying for? Unity. As thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be uh, one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved me as thou hast loved them. Jesus' prayer was for unity for us. He knew it was going to take a lot of work. He knew we would need the Spirit of God to help us to bring about unity in the life of the church body. There's too much infighting going on in churches. Church, church, uh, church uh, family, the, our brothers and sisters in Christ, sometimes we get lazy in working towards unity. We get tired of it. We, we, we just, we're, our flesh fights against it. We want to say, oh, I, I, I need to say this. I need to speak my mind. I need to tell. I need to, I need to, right? We fight against unity and we fight against the Spirit of God when we do that. Many people, they say, well, I, I'm, sh I'm done with this. I, I don't like the way that this is doing. I don't, I don't agree with this and I don't agree with that, so I'm leaving. That fights against the unity that God wants us to have. We're not saying this evening that we should fight against false doctrine. We should. We should stand against it. We should, we should hate it. But most of the stuff, listen, most of the things that brothers and sisters squabble over have nothing to do with doctrine. Absolutely nothing. And you're allowing Satan to get a foothold in the life of the church. And this is my warning to us as a church tonight. That, as Jesus says, if, if we're not unified, then the world won't see Jesus Christ. I want you to look at Revelation chapter 2 as we end. Revelation chapter 2, it speaks, starts to speak of the seven churches uh, of Asia. And lo and behold, look who the first church is. The church in Ephesus. One of the oldest churches, one of the most established churches here in this list of churches. They've been around a little while, right? And we see that the Lord gives a warning to this church. Like Paul wrote here that they need to be unified. That they need to come under the bonds of love and, 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 and the bonds of peace, excuse me, and to forbear in love. And they need to have these attributes as a church. They need to, 
But we find here that they lose it. Here in Revelation chapter 2, speaking of the church of Ephesus, it says, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, that's Jesus Christ, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. He says here, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast born and, and, and uh, hast patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not feigned. And nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first, what? Love. Love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first work, or else I will come unto thee quickly. And what's he going to do? He says here, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. The light will be taken away because of their lack of love. Verse 6, he says, but this thou Past that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. I, I, I bring that up because this church, they, they, they stood on the truth, right? They were a well-established church and they stood on the truth. They stood on God's word and they would not compromise the truths of God's word. And I, I find our church to be that way as well, that we stand on the truths of God's word and we do not compromise the truths of God's word. And we stand on that and we're careful to, to understand who's, who, who's speaking truth and who's really truly speaking the word of God and who's not. And we do test those that say they are and are not. And have found some to be liars. And we, we do those kinds of things. And we stand on those kinds of things. But we see here the, 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 the propensity that we have. If we start to do that. We have the propensity to what? Lack love. And he even mentions the Nicolaitans. Nicolaitans were, were a group of, uh, of, of people that believed in uh, antinomianism. Pastor uh, 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 talked about antinomianism on Wednesday. And the idea that uh, uh, um, Christ has set us free. We can do whatever we want. And they were very sexually pr promiscuous. They, they did all kinds of just nasty, nasty things and had really bad doctrine. And so he says, yes, yes, speak out against those. But you know what? Church, you've left your first love. You've forgotten here about what's truly important. And Jesus commends the Ephesians, like I said, for their, for their good works. And it says for their labor and for their patience, their hard work. They, this patience, the idea is that they, they, they endured hardships and persevered without growing weary. And they tested these teachers to see whether their professions were real. But... They had lost their warmth and zeal for Christ. And when that happened, they began to go through the motions of good works. Not, they, they, they were not motivated by love for, for, for Christ, but just by the works themselves. What was once a love relationship cooled into mere religion. They had become like the Pharisees. And their passion for Christ became little more than cold orthodoxy. They were so worried about being right that they began to hate others. And they began to be, as what we've been looking at here, they, they lost their lowliness, their humbleness, they lost their meekness, they lost their patience, they lost their tolerance. And Jesus says here that I'm going to take the candle Stick away. I'm going to take your light out. That you no longer will be effective at spreading the gospel of Christ around the world. And as your missionary, it's important that you stay unified. It's important that we come together in unity. Because if we don't, that light's going to go away. And so my warning to you through the scriptures tonight is that if we aren't unified, it destroys the work of God. It's not easy. Unity doesn't come easily. 
Did you find it in your marriage that it was easy to be unified? Yeah, where it takes hard work to be a husband and wife that love one another and care about one another. It doesn't happen naturally. And it's the same way in a church. It doesn't come easy. You have to work for it. And when we don't, the work of God around the entire world is affected. If you say, I'm, t- I'm done with this, I don't care, and you leave this, our wonderful church family, that's going to affect somebody else around the world. I promise you. We need to be unified. And during this time of this pandemic, it's easy to lose focus. You get on to other churches' websites and web pages and live streams and begin to be tempted. Oh, you know, I like that and I like this. And well, they 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 fit my preferences a little bit better. But did God not call you to be a part of this family? Don't so easily leave your family. Be unified, or the lights will go out. Lord, we love you. We thank you for being patient with us. Lord, I beg for unity. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be unified. Lord, that we would really love each other. That we work hard at it. Souls are hanging in the balance all around the world. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, church, thank you for uh, watching with us on the live stream and i um, glad that you were here and I pray that you'll have a good week and we'll see you next time. All right, goodbye.